Hello, and welcome to this brief introduction to randomized block designs. So far, we've looked at one-way analyses of variance, where we have a continuous response and different levels of a categorical predictor, and we want to know whether by changing those levels we are having an effect on that response. And here's an example uh, in terms of the GLM format. There's our continuous response uh, yield. And uh, here are two different levels of a fertilizer, two types of fertilizer. And we wish to establish uh, whether we can reject the null hypothesis that fertilizer type has no effect on the yield. Well, we can expand this approach of analysis of variance to looking at not just one type of factor, but two or more types of factor. Here, for example, is the two-way analysis of variance uh, in the case of a continuous response yield. And yet, in this case, we have two broad types of categorical predictor. We have the type of fertilizer applied, and we have the type of pesticide applied too. In the simplest case, the uh, very simplest GLM that we can fit for a two-way analysis of variance is this, where we have the continuous response being shaped potentially by the types of a fertilizer that are applied here, this first factor, and here is the second factor, uh, the type of pesticide. This is a two-way analysis of variance because we have two types of factor and in this case we have two levels of this factor and two levels of this factor. Now this design can be expanded to consider subtle interactions between fertilizer and pesticide in its effect on yield and the type of model that we'd be fitting in these instances would be a full model including interactions. However, we'll leave interactions till a later lesson. Let's now go back to the standard two-way analysis of variance uh, without interaction. And this is often known as a randomized block design, particularly when one of those factors is something that we're not particularly interested in, but we know that we should be controlling for uh, when conducting our experiment. So, for example, we might have yield being dependent on the type of fertilizer, but also uh, there might be a block, and that block might be uh, different parts of the field, as we'll go on and have a look in an example in a minute. Or it could be different times those experiments were run. It could have been run in one year and then in another year. So we've got to control for year somehow, uh, but it's not necessarily the uh, main thing we're interested in. We want to know uh, whether fertilizer type really does have an influence on the yield. And so here we've got a continuous response, and in this case we have two categorical predictors. Why is blocking such a useful design component? So imagine we've got four types of fertilizer, A, B, C, and D. And imagine also uh, we're in the real world where we've got to look at the growth of plants with these types of fertilizer, but we're faced with a potential gradient of water such that we have low water level uh, going to high water level here. Well, one particular uh, design uh, would be, well, this looks neat, having all our A's here, all the types of fertilizer B here, C and D. However, this would be an entirely inappropriate design to choose because, uh, of course, water confounds. If we did the analysis and found, for example, that uh, fertilizer D looked like it had the highest overall yield of plants, how do we know that that's not actually caused by the water level rather than the fertilizer? An alternative approach is to simply randomly allocate the four replicates of each of the types of fertilizer across the entire grid. In this case, uh, what we have here is the water gradient uh, adding noise to the overall relationship, but not obscuring it in the way that the former design did. So it's an improvement, but we could get better. 
Here is the uh, far superior design in which we actually control for the gradient at the same time as investigating its effect. In this particular design what we have is each of the four levels of the fertilizer represented for each of the uh, ranges of water levels that we have from low to high level. So in this case we've structured our design such that we can separately analyze for the effect of fertilizer and yet at the same time look at the effect of the water gradient. So this is a randomized block design. Blocks are typically levels of a factor that may influence the response although we're not necessarily interested in them in their own right we only want to get a better understanding of the role of another treatment in influencing that response. Blocks should clearly be as internally homogeneous as possible such that the same water levels should be uh, are approximately the same at least uh, in each of these uh, uh, levels here of our blocks. Blocks can uh, be spatial, uh, temporal or even uh, genetical uh, and uh, there are a lot of reasons why we might want to control for uh, any given variable uh, in our data. Typically there's no replication within blocks. You'll see that we have uh, one replicate of each of the levels of fertilizer. Uh, but sometimes there is uh, more than one replicate. But it really does help for reasons of orthogonality, which we'll get on to later, to have the same number of replicates of each of the treatment levels uh, in a given block. Let's have a look at these data, which come from Sokol and Rolf's biometry. The data refer to the mean weights of trebolium beetles of different genotypes. We have a wild type, red eye and hairy wing grown in standard conditions. Now this experiment was actually repeated four times so we have experiment as a block and we're primarily interested in the differences between the weights of these different uh, genotypes in our experiment course we can plot these graphs out and the data appear as if the red genotype does seem to have a higher weight certainly than uh, the hairy genotype. But how can we analyze these data? Well to begin with we're going to analyze it in a rather silly way which isn't appropriate. We're going to ignore the experiment uh, which delivered each of the data points completely. And so by this uh, we're going to simply fit a relationship between weight and genotype. I should say that the genotype is clearly a categorical uh, predictor with three different levels. And we're going to simply plot out the fit of that simple one-way analysis of variance. And this is what we get. What you'll see here is that um, we have no significant effect of genotype on the weight in that we can't reject the null hypothesis that there is no uh, relationship between genotype uh, level and weight. And so uh, the other thing I'd like you to note is that the overall sum of squares uh, of the residuals or the error sum of squares as it's sometimes called uh, is about 0.0256. So uh, in this case we've got a relatively high amount of variability because all we've controlled for really uh, is a genotype and uh, experiment hasn't been entered into the analysis. Now let's conduct the appropriate analysis, this time controlling for both genotype and the experiment. So here we are. Here are the primary results in which we've got the weight and we're interested to see how the weight might vary with genotype and with the experiment which goes from 1 to 4 although in this case we're treating experiment as a categorical predictor. Let's have a look at those results. So in this case we have an analysis of variance table which shows us that genotype is highly significant in explaining variation in weight. How come it's changed from not significant to highly significant? Well, we have also accounted for the experiment in our data and the experiment actually explains significant uh, variability. 
So, we've got a significant effect of genotype and experiment on weight. You'll notice also that the error sum of squares has reduced to something really very small now because the experiment used to be part of the error sum of squares but now we've accounted for it. So what we find here is that this blocking using experiment was a means of controlling for the variability that would otherwise be attributed to noise. So our blocking has done two things. First of all, it's allowed us to establish whether there was effect of experiment, and in this case there clearly was. But secondly, it's allowed a much more powerful test in that we have removed some of the variability in our data, we've accounted for it, and therefore allowed us to have a much more powerful test of the effect of genotype on our weight. Of course, all of these fitted models uh, depend on a variety of assumptions and you will now be familiar with the assumptions made by GLMs, including uh, the fact that the residuals are assumed to be homogeneously distributed around the fitted model and uh, here they do appear to be, and also that those residuals are normally distributed around the fitted model and from this QQ plot uh, we see that that is uh, broadly held out.